All right, welcome everyone. We're going to be talking with Sue today on another one of our Every Child Ready to Read uh, webinars here. I'm Kathy Lancaster. I'm with the Library of Michigan. Uh, if you take a look on the bottom right hand corner of your screen, we have um, some files for you that Sue will be talking about, as well as the um, family engagement slides for today's presentation. Um, we're also recording this webinar. Um, if anybody has to jump off during it, uh, we will be sending out the link to the webinar uh, to everyone who registered. So you'll get the recording if you're not able to stay with us the whole time. But of course, we hope you, you can. Sue, are you, are you there? Yes, I am. Ready to go. All right. Well, I will hand it over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Kathy. Okay, today we're going to talk about family engagement and also kindergarten readiness. I will tell you, as Kathy mentioned, um, at the bottom right hand part of your screen where the files are, one of the handouts is actually going to give you two links to different family engagement uh, articles and documents, I should say, I guess, that are put out by the American Library Association that talk more, much more in depth about family engagement. But I'm going to highlight some things from, from those documents and from other sources. So we'll get started. First of all, I think we should define it. Family engagement is actually a shared responsibility among families and educators and communities, all with the goal of supporting children's learning and their development. It begins at birth, continues through young adulthood. It can happen anywhere but we want to talk today about what can the library role be in family engagement. First of all, why, why are we going to target families? What's the reason to target them? One of the things uh, we know is that children exhibit healthy development. They are successful academically when that family is actually fostering warm and nurturing relationships when that family takes responsibility for their kids' learning, and when they support their children's interest. So we know that that's very vital. One of the things we want to think about, why should the library play a role in this? What is the purpose of the library? You know, a lot of times, we heard about the importance of parent involvement in relation to schools. The schools have jumped on this bandwagon a long time ago um, and getting parents involved with their kids' academics and the success they're going to have in school. But why not libraries? You know, it's not just for schools anymore. Why, what about the role that we can actually play? For example, we have very rich resources, digital, books, recordings, etc. And we can help guide families on how to use these materials to help their children learn. You know, libraries really span generations. And I think that's really important. You know, we reach out to everyone from the infant to the toddler to the teen up to grandparents. So we serve all. We span all generations. Also, when you think about how we play an important role just to help with equity, you know, families with high incomes spend nearly seven times more money for their kids on a different enrichment activities, whether it be music lessons or summer camp or travel, than families from low-income homes. So the opportunities for these kids to succeed in the low-income families are greatly diminished. Whereas libraries are free, trusted, safe, welcoming places that everyone in the community can use to help balance these inequalities. And finally, another thing I think to think about is that we can establish partnerships with other community organizations and connect people to other organizations and community agencies that will help them. Okay, next, uh, 
Why is this a role for children's librarians? Why is it important for us to think about this? Well, I think children's librarians are really good at creating very welcoming spaces for families and children. Not only do we give family opportunities to be involved in their kids' learning activities, but we actually invite them to do that when we have them sit in in our story times um, and join along in with the rhymes and the songs and everything we're doing within that program. Another important thing is the fact that we can model different actions that family members can take to help support that young kid's learning. All right, so for the last year and almost a half now, Michigan has been involved with this Every Child Ready to Read project, and some of you have probably been to different trainings or have attended the uh, other webinars that I've done, or hopefully are reading my monthly newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> which has different things about every child ready to read. I think this family engagement is kind of one step above. You know, it's like it's one additional step above what we're already doing with every child ready to read. Um, and it can be like a next step. You know, parents with young children are more likely than other adults to use library services. And having a child or a grandchild actually increases and adults use of library services. Now some of these statistics I'm giving you, they're, they're all um, referenced and I could give you references for every one of them, but most of the statistics I'm giving are going to be found in those documents that I mentioned before. So how can we work with families beyond what we are doing for early literacy in our story time programs and what we're already doing with Every Child Ready to Read? I think there's a lot of other services and programs that we can consider. Um, to help children beyond just supporting early literacy. I mean, there's other goals that we can have. And one of the things I want you to think about right now is what are some other services or what are some other programs that we can do or what are some other services and programs that you have already done? So when we're talking about these things today and some of the different programs that people have done or things that you might have done, I really wish that you would type into the chat box maybe some things that you have done specifically geared towards families beyond just maybe a, a standard story time. And I want you to type them in at any time. I will try to keep track of the chat box now and then between slides to um, mention some of those things, because I think it's very important that we share on this. Okay, let's start out thinking about uh, one thing that we can do. We're, we're going to talk about several things we can do. One is just thinking about babies in the very beginning. We know how important brain development is. You know, starting at birth, parent and child interactions influence the development of a child's brain. The way a parent responds to that child's gestures and smiles and cries is going to affect the neural, neural con, uh, connections that are in the brain. And actually, one of the things we know from the brain research is that um, the more um, experiences a child has, sensory experiences, the more synapses that are going to connect between the neurons in the brain. And that's really going to help children's brain development. So infant bra infants' brains grow when parents or caregivers make eye contact, when they repeat baby's words, when they repeat their smiles, when they read to them. And young children who grow up in this rich home reading environment are going to develop these strong brain connections, which is going to help them throughout life, of course. So I want you to think about um, what types of books do you have in your collection for babies? I know a lot of you have board books. Are they good board books? Do they have rounded edges and not pointed edges? Are they board books that are not filled with a lot of sentences on each page, or a lot of illustrations on each page, which is too busy for babies. Think about that collection and what type of materials you have. And then also think about what types of programs that you provide. I hope a lot of you are doing baby story times. And by the way, I'm going to do just a little commercial twice a day. If you have not ever done a baby story time, or if there's someone in your library that has not, and they want a little bit of extra help with this or maybe some ideas about how to do a baby story time, that is going to be our next webinar. Not just babies, but story times in general, story time basics. So think about these services you have. 
Uh, and you might want to also add that to the chat box. So let's go to the chat box right now and just see what's coming up here before I go on to the next slide. Wow, we've had a whole bunch come in here. <laughs> Let me go back to the beginning of it. Okay, Lynn says, I go out to the home daycares once a month for story time. Jeannie says, provide support materials with the stories. Uh, Becky is saying, family library night, show off library resources, a scavenger hunt around the library. That's good. I like that. Uh, let's see. Stephanie says, I started a family Saturday story time program. Pamela, family celebration days focused around a book character or a theme that includes books and STEM activities, a family uh, focused project. And we're going to talk about some libraries that have done um, story times around STEM in a moment. Uh, and Jeannie, Janine saying sensory books. Oh, okay, so she has sensory books in her collection, touch and feel books, good. Uh, Lynn, I can reach a lot of children whose parents would never bring them to the library. Very good. And that's some of the things we're going to talk about today, like outreach. Emily's saying Saturday family story time, family coloring party. Ooh, that's interesting, a coloring party. <laughs> I like that idea. Okay, so moving on from the, uh, we'll look at some more ideas in a moment. Moving on from babies and brain development. Uh, learning to read. Let's just think about that and how we, what we can do to help um, families engage with the child's process on learning to read. Probably of all the ways in which families matter for children's learning, probably the most important is how to support that child's language and literacy and reading abilities. So we know that learning to read is a very complex process. It has to begin in these early years. Um, and it involves a lot of things like sounds and comprehension and environmental print, etc. What we know is that children do not develop these literacy skills on their own. They have to have support from uh, parents and experiences with other, particularly those people in their family. So through reading at home and everyday conversations and uh, telling stories and sharing books and singing and playing, Families are helping these children's language and literacy skills grow. I also like to think about how important it is for families to be models to those children, to show kids that they themselves enjoy reading. So family engagement is important also for young dual language learners uh, who not only have to main, or who are maintaining their own native language, but also have to learn um, English. So I want you to think a little bit now, and again, this is another chat box opportunity. Um, what have you done, if anything, to specifically help kids who are learning to read? Is your collection, your uh, I can read books, um, arranged in a certain way? Are they easy for parents to access as far as, you know, what reading level their child's at? Um, can, can they find those materials easily? I know that the last library I worked in, probably well, actually, the whole time I was in libraries, and again, this might have changed, but the whole time I was in libraries, one of the most common things was, where are books for my child who is just beginning to learn to read? And if you would point out like an easy reading, sec reading section or an I can read section, they'd pull out one of those books and they'd, get, they'd look at it and they'd say, no, 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 this is entirely too hard. You must not understand. My child is just beginning to learn to read. So we're talking about very, very, very simple I can read things. And some of those are hard to find. So what I did, which it sounds like such a simple little thing, but I want to tell you how much I used that. I made a list. We put it, we had a list format. We had it in a bookmark format of those books that were just the very, very, very first steps because that was a question we got asked so often. So again, I want you to think about, you know, what have you done or what can you do uh, as far as kids who are learning to read? How can you help those families? Pamela, let's see what she's saying here. Uh, she has the Bob books. If you don't know what the Bob books are, um, kind of like little paperbacks, but they are definitely books for a child who is just beginning to learn to read. We check them out as a set. They are numbered by levels. Good. Becky says, Paul's for reading with dogs. Yeah, we're going to have that uh, come up again. Reading buddies with teen volunteers to, to practice uh, reading skills. Um, Kathy's giving you some type of article from Hornbook. Uh, welcome to family reading. Okay. 
Janine says, uh, rhyming letter visuals and books listed next to the visual. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so she has letter visuals with books next to the visual. I'm um, just going to wait another second before I move on to the next slide to see if we have anything else coming in because I think someone is typing right now. Uh, before I move on to the next slide, um, I will tell you we're going to be talking, we're going to move from learning to read to uh, how families um, matter for literacy in a digital wor world. Okay, Pamela says we have easy, easy phonics games in the children's wing. Okay, very good. Some all good ideas. Okay, the digital world and and how families matter for literacy in a digital world. You know, families play an active role in guiding and monitoring children's uses of digital media. On average, parents of two to 10 year olds spend about one hour a day using media with their children. That includes watching TV, using mobile devices and computers or playing video games. Now these parents feel that their participation is helpful for their children, not only from pr protecting them from inappropriate content, but as well as spending time together. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a learning experience. So when parents use this digital media alongside their children, the educational value of the experience is greatly enhanced. Young children are more likely than older ones uh, to co-view media with parents. So again, what can libraries do? Uh, I don't know, do any of you have a space where the parent and child can sit down together at the computer or in your children's library and the kids just sitting by themselves at the computer? So is there space for co-viewing, for instance? Um, another idea is recommending sites or recommending apps. You know, there's so many apps out there. What are some good ones for these very young children? Do you have a way that you recommend either computer sites or apps. And then, of course, a third thing would be, um, you know, digital safety. <laughs> um, you know, how offering things to parents or programs on how they can keep their kids safe digitally. You know, um, we can be mentors, media mentors. We can guide families in how to use technology and digital media. media. Um, you know, it's, it's not just enough for families to have access to these tools. They also have to have the knowledge and skills to be able to use the tools. And I think that's one role that the library can play. And I alluded to this before, but I'm going to mention it again. You have to realize that a lot of low-income families or, or less educated families um, are more likely to need help in this area. So we have the expertise. We have the access to technology we can be well positioned uh, to take on this role. So let's look here at the chat box and see if anyone has added things about this. Emily says, we have iPad stations and off stations. Parents almost always sit with children at the off stations and frequently at the iPad. Good. Kathy has also put up another link. Um, Kathy, I'm not sure what that link's about, but you all can go to it and find it. It looks like it's kids and media, I would say, link. Uh, Jessica says, um, she's typing now to let me know, thank goodness. Jessica says, we really need to do something for recommended sites and apps beyond, oh, okay, that must be a Michigan thing, and digital safety. My community had a huge sexting scandal in the high schools, uh, so that's Michigan eLibrary. Okay, um, I will let Kathy and Jessica talk that one out because that's uh, something I don't have as much familiarity with since I'm not in Michigan, but uh, Jessica says she feels that we need some recommended, do something for uh, recommended sites and apps besides just that and digital safety. So that's a uh, consideration um, and I'll let, I'll let Kathy address that in now or in the future. Okay, so moving on, we're going to think also about how libraries can play a part as community centers. We can help families connect with each other. We can help them find the resources that they need in the community. We can recommend certain um, organizations. Now, some of the programs I'm going to tell you about today are from a document that was um, I listed in your handout. It was kind of like an idea book uh, for different family programs. So I'm just going to give some examples throughout today. And here's one of them right now. Um, libraries are 
also incorporating health and wellness and exercise programs into their service. For example, the Urban Library Council has recognized the free summer lunch program for children uh, who might otherwise go without a healthy meal is one of their top library innovations and things that they want to consider right now. So now we have gone kind of what beyond what we normally think a library role would be. Today's libraries also extend beyond their physical roles. There are uh, bookmobiles that go to shopping malls, housing projects, health centers. It's taking the library out to families. And by the way, if anyone um, does something interesting with their bookmobile that's not listed there or does something that is listed there, I wouldn't mind hearing about that in the chat box also. And finally, uh, adult education classes such as GED classes or English as second language classes. Uh, you know, we're more, the U.S. is more culturally and ethically diverse than ever before. Our English language learner population is expected to grow rapidly. The number of school aged children from immigrant families is expected to increase to 17.9 million by 2020, which is up from 12.3 million in 2005. So these are just a couple ways libraries can kind of act as community centers themselves. Okay, let's go back to the chat box. Um, okay, so Kathy's mentioning Meet Up and Eat Up, Summer Food in Michigan. So there's a program already in Michigan for that. Uh, again, does anyone have their bookmobile going to like daycares or stopping at preschools or going to housing projects? I would be interested in knowing if anyone has anything like that. Don't see any typing right now, but um, oh, someone's typing. So we'll see what comes up. I just think you know that's another thing to think about. Can can these uh, can we reach people in other places uh, with our book mobile besides just the normal? I guess you'd say the normal um, book mobile stops. Uh, Natalie, we offer preschool and kindergarten tours at our library. Okay. Um, Lisa says, we take our summer reading program out to local daycares. That's good. That's really a good, good way to approach them. Uh, I think there's some more things coming up. But while they come up, let's just move on one more slide. Um, and we're going to talk about libraries that have actually given families input into their programs. Again, this is part of the whole big family engagement thing in libraries. Let's give the family some input. Different libraries are listening to families and they're letting the families help co-design programs for children. I think this is interesting. I was reading about this in the research. Here's one example. Again, Watertown Free Public Library, this is in Massachusetts, keeps families coming back by involving them in creating the actual programs they're going to offer. So by offering pro programs and services that families say they actually want, libraries are demonstrating that they are listening and they're responding to the feedback, which is, of course is going to create a very positive library family relationships. Uh, another idea, which I know it's going to really, really depend on staffing, but I just think it's an interesting thought and I'm going to throw it out there. There were in the idea book of family engagement, there were uh, different libraries that are offering programs multiple times a day or over the course of a week, the same program. So parents have several opportunities to participate. For example, maybe you're having one family program on Wednesday night. They'll offer this several times because not everybody can make it Wednesday night. Now, again, I know this could depend on staffing. What we have to remember is that li libraries and librarians, we're not there just to teach parents skills, etc. We need to provide learning experiences and hands-on things so that they're actually having learning themselves. And we need to give them a little bit of input into what we're doing. Okay, let's go back to the chat box again. Um, let's see. Emily is saying we offer pop-up library services at Little League games. Well, that is neat. Parks and preschools. And we're gonna, I, I have pop-up coming up. Thank you, Emily. That's great. Jessica says, we've had programs with a local fitness coach. Ooh, stories of Muba. I love that. And Lynn's saying, our town has a summer rec program that we visit weekly. Very good. 
Patricia says we do a weekly story time play time at our local farmer's market. Wow. I don't know if I've heard of a library going to the farmer's market before. Very good input. I love all those ideas. Okay. Let's talk about outreach. And some of these things you're talking about are definitely outreach there. But let's just zero in a, a little bit more about why, why should we do outreach. Um, we know that there's disparities existing in usage, um, library usage for families. I mean, families from low income and low education families are obviously going to less likely use the library than families from the upper income homes. And that's why we need to try to do more outreach, outreach where we can strive to link with families, especially those who are less likely to use our resources. Libraries that have effective outreach efforts um, first have to identify the characteristics of families uh, that might not be using the library consistently. And why, why are they not using it? Is it because they're unaware of the tools and resources we have? Do they not understand the expertise that the library has to offer? They simply not choose to come or one thing that I often have thought about is are we a threatening institution? If you have a low education level and libraries are kind of seen as an educational facility, are we a threatening institution to enter? So these are all thoughts, things to think about. Um, in relation to outreach. Uh, but again, I think one of the important things to remember is we have these resources that these low income neighborhoods really could use. Um, and one of the things from the statistics that's a little bit encouraging is that families that do live in poverty are more likely to visit a library than what they're going to a bookstore or a museum. So at least we seem a little bit more accessible than some of those other places. So strategies to reach families not coming to the library, any other out outreach ideas? Now, obviously, a lot of the things you mentioned um, in, this, in the chat box before um, were outreach things. Um, but let's see if there's anything else that comes up. Kathy's saying collaborate on programming on places families may be going, markets, uh, laundry mats, and health centers, definitely. Great for out, outreach. Uh, we have some more things coming in, so let me just wait here a second. Uh, yeah, Emily says she loves a laundromat. So do I. <laughs> That's really different. Natalie's saying our outreach associate performs a weekly. Oh, should they have an outreach associate? That's interesting. Our outreach associate performs a weekly STEM program at a local low-income housing community. This is great. You guys should have sent your ideas into this idea book that ALA did because some of these are really fabulous. Uh, Lynn's saying also parks. Um, Janine's saying um, school schools, daycares would welcome guests. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just waiting another second to see if anything else comes in. Oh, beaches. <laughs> okay, I'll volunteer to go to the beach <laughs> to a story time. Uh, Jessica's saying uh, brochures and little free libraries. Uh, Shannon's saying homeless centers. I don't know if that means she goes to homeless centers, but either way, that is certainly um, an excellent idea. Okay, so those are all good ideas uh, for outreach. Okay, what I'm going to talk about next is from the idea book, and again, I gave you um, a link to this. Um, oh, one other thing, uh, Kathy's adding here. Let me get this diaper diaper pantries. Interesting. Okay, that's another good idea. Okay, I'm going to give you some ideas. Now, some of the things I'm going to talk about, these are from that idea book that, again, I gave you a link to this. It's like a, I don't know, 30, 40 page document. I'm only going to pull out just a few ideas. Some of them I totally understand are going to be way beyond what you could do unless you're at a very large metro library with a lot of funds. But I think it's just interesting to see what some people are doing. And actually, some of your ideas have been even more exciting, but let's just look at a couple of these. Um, this is from uh, King County Library System. Uh, they use principles of every child ready to read. Yay, that's what we're talking about, every child ready to read. They use principles of every child ready to read to train grandparents and, of course, also child care providers. They uh, trained the also diverse community members. 
who speak other languages, such as Spanish or Somalia or Japanese and Mandarin, they train them in principles of ECRR so that they can lead bilingual story time sessions and then also just spread information in general to families that the library uh, might not reach otherwise because of language barriers. Okay, Pierce County Library System, uh, north there. This They have begun deliberately to integrate math concepts and science concepts into story time. Of course, some of you said you're doing that also. They have developed in partnership um, with some local educational um, schools a program that promotes block play among young children. Uh, the librarians and the teachers and Head Start and different early childhood educators, they all receive this training in block play. And once each month, the classroom children visit the library for an extended block play period and story time. Now, again, funding is probably going to be limited for some of us to do this, but I think it's neat that they evidently found the funding to do this. The children actually receive a free set of wooden blocks to use at home, along with a free book at each visit, and families are encouraged to participate in open block play sessions at the library. They have done evaluations of this, and they find that children's mathematical competencies and literacy levels are improving. Okay, here's another one. This is David and Joyce Milne Public Library. They um, actually talked to parents and allowed the parents to create and run a bilingual story time program. Evidently, they did not have anyone on staff that could do this, which is probably the norm. And so they trained parents. And now the library has a very successful, well-attended Spanish story time that's run almost completely by parents in the community which I think is kind of neat. Um, so these Spanish, some of these Spanish speaking families who had never set foot in the library are now coming for this Spanish uh, story time, which is conducted by parents. I'm gonna mention Watertown a lot today. They, <laughs> it seems like they're doing a lot of different things and they're mentioning this idea book a lot. They uh, dedicate uh, a portion of their story time session to conversations among families about questions they have. So. What they did was they kind of talked to families of young, very young children about um, what, are, what are some of the things that they would like to see. And one of the things that the families mentioned is we'd like to have um, some answers to some questions and things that, ha that we need help with, like what are the best car safety seats, what are the best foods for babies, etc. So now a part of their story time, at the end of each story time, they actually get into opening up to like questions and families like talking to each other and helping each other uh, with these types of um, needs. Columbus Metro is in Ohio and I spent my whole career in Ohio and they, I, I will just say right off that they really are doing a lot of interesting stuff for early literacy. They have won several ALA awards. However, they are well funded and I'm not sure that everybody could do this, but I just, you know, it's, when you think about libraries and how we've changed over the years, it's just amazing to me what they are doing. Again, this, this program actually, they won some kind of national award for this. They have, they actually have, well, first of all, they, they really feel that parents are a child's first teacher. We all know that. So what they want to do is they set up this ready to read home visitation program where they go out and actually conduct monthly home visits with parents of children from birth to age five. They take a different book each month. They show parents um, strategies to help with, you know, phonological awareness and narrative skills and vocabulary, all that stuff we've talked about. And after the visit, the parent and kids get to keep the book. They've done an evaluation and the results are definitely showing that the parent increased knowledge of early literacy behaviors. Now, I will tell you, when East, when Every Child Ready to Read first came out many, many years ago, first edition, uh, 2004, I want to say, uh, they tried having people come to the library for early childhood or, or ECR or workshops, and they found out it was not successful. They offered food. That helped a little bit. And that's when they got the idea to actually go out to the homes. They thought, we're going to meet people who just aren't coming to our library right now. So again, I realize that you'd have to have a lot of staff and money to probably do this, but it's it's a really, really neat idea if you have any way to do it. Okay, New Brunswick Free Public Library. 
Um, this is in New Jersey. And again, several of you said you have done this. They offer math and science story times to preschool age children. Um, you know, songs, gross motor activities, hands-on activities, stories, of course. A little interesting twist here is they hold the sessions in summer and evening. So again, some of you talked about what you're doing in the summer. So um, and at rec parks, etc. So this is uh, this is a this is a doable idea. I think that New Brunswick is doing. Okay, Brooklyn Public Library. Again, this has been written up a lot in the literature. If you get School Library Journal, for instance, it's been written up a lot. Uh, this is another one of these award-winning programs. They're literally sending text messages to parents. Um, with ideas for literacy activities. It's part of the Ready, Set, Kindergarten program. And the text messages include follow-up ideas that parents can use to promote learning at home, as well as encourage regular program attendance. They send these messages at a time when they think it's going to be more convenient for parents, once a, uh, once a week, you know, in the evenings or on the weekends. And because that was so successful with those kids entering kindergarten, they have now extended this texting message service to children birth to age three to help support early literacy. So um, I think that's a really neat idea. Uh, we just talked about the math and science, and Kathy has put up another uh, resource, uh, Bedtime Math Summer of Numbers Details, a, a, an article there that you might be interested in. Okay, moving on. Uh, Watertown, here's Watertown again. I just like this approach because they're really trying to get dads in the library too, you know? And you might already have dads coming to, to some of your programs, but it's just a different focus to try to directly get them involved. They call it Dads and Donuts. It's a monthly program for dads and male caregivers where they definitely try to reach the males and they do little story time programs. But sometimes, you know, dads aren't the ones that would normally come. So by specifically focusing on them, um, they get more dads involved with the kids' early learning. Uh, Lynn is saying when you go into a home or daycare, you are not just teaching the children, you're also giving parents and caregivers the tools of how to do story time with the children, and that is most definitely definitely true. We're definitely modeling, and um, it's, it's so important. It's beyond just the children, as she's saying. Okay, here's another idea. This is from Panorama City Branch of uh, a Los Angeles library. These um, are what they call, um, I'm sorry, I lost my place here for a minute. I apologize. These are what they call, um, they're, they're, they're actually backpacks is what they are. And they, they're like little play kits. And they have developmentally appropriate toys and books and activity cards uh, in the kits. And the reason they do this is they're trying to spark creativity and conversation between parents and their children so that parents and kids have more verbal interactions. Um, and the play kits, they said, have greatly increased the circulation of books in their library also. It was so successful that they are now you know, spreading out to some of their other branches. Dallas Public Library, um, again, they are offering story times and other learning programs right at the mall. Right, right in the mall, uh, and they're getting like two to three hundred families at one time. They had to move it to like the center course in the mall. They started out in one end, and then they had to put them like right in the center because they were so popular. I don't know if any the rest of you do anything like that, but I think that's a, a really great idea. And then Madison Public Library, they offer an App Finder database um, on their library website that has reviews and recommendations of apps. Uh, for families of young children. The way they promote this is, is geared more, the, they try to gear a lot of, the, a lot of it to uh, children ages eight and under. And to make families more aware of the resources and to highlight new, new resources, they actually go on their local TV news to talk about the, the newest app that they're going to put on the database next and how to access it, et cetera. So they were able to get some uh, local TV time there also. Okay, so those are just a couple, again, they were just a couple of ideas from that family engagement idea book. I only highlighted the ones specifically related to young children because this uh, webinar is in conjunction with the Every Child Ready to Read project, so if that's for the very young children, I tried to highlight just those programs. If you're interested in some others, um, there's a lot of ideas that go the whole way up through 
um, you know, teenagers. Uh, but I just didn't highlight those today because I was trying to to keep to our audience of, or, you know, the, the people that will be involved in like the Every Child Ready to Read project. So is family engagement programming for you? These are some things to think about. Are you interested in engaging families to promote children's lifelong learning? Are you seeking inspiration to reach families? Are you wondering how to create new meaningful experiences? And if so, you might want to think about family engagement. Okay, let's look at some really simple ideas of things we can do besides story time. Not only different programs we could do, but maybe where we could take them. But before I start that, I see there's some other things coming here that I need to um oh, okay that's i'll look at yeah all right so we're going to talk about um what some other for family program might be besides story times and where we can take them and how we can reach to maybe some families who aren't already coming so let's talk about reading programs so we have summer reading program it's like okay once summer's over what we don't do reading program anymore i think particularly for young children you know sometimes the older kids they might be more engaged in other activities or whatever but for young children I think that's, you know, something else we need to think about. You know, why can't we have a summer read or not summer? Why can't we have a reading program in conjunction with our story time? Why can't we go out to uh, Head Start and see if we can get them involved in like a reading program for kids and have some kind of a, uh, rewards that might be of interest to those kids? Um, music programs, song picture books, um, play and make musical instruments. Uh, or open-ended art activities. Again, could we do something like this, a program like this out somewhere? Could we do a music program in a mall, for instance? Nursery rhyme time. Now, this one's really important because so many kids arrive at school and don't know nursery rhymes. And why are nursery rhymes so important? It's because of phonological awareness. That really helps with phonological awareness. So having a nursery rhyme time with picture book versions of rhymes and having stations with games, crafts, food, etc. Again, this is another program I think that might be more easy to take out somewhere. Uh, science night or math night. Again, something we could do in the library, but something we might think about taking out. It's another family program we could do for very young children besides just story time. The family picnic and games, sharing books like Teddy Bear's Picnic or whatever, and playing some old-fashioned picnic games, that's a good program for the library to do in a rec park. Uh, someone already mentioned they do the book buddy, the reading the reading to the dogs, etc. cetera. Uh, you can have speakers come in on, about pets. And then families reading together. Now, this is just another idea for having um, a reading program some other time of the year that's not necessarily summer and having them have the families reading together <laughs> not just the kids reading it's families reading together and they play a book bingo and actually i i know it's gonna be maybe a little bit hard to, well you can't see it really but it doesn't matter because it's a handout <laughs> you can download it as a handout the free space is visit the library but it's families reading together like read a science book read an alphabet book read a dr seuss book and then whenever they complete a bingo, they would bring it back to the library. And you have to have some kind of neat thing. Like maybe, I don't know, when I did this, this is just one example. There was the this um, puppet troupe that used to travel the country. I know they're not in existence anymore. They were called, I think they were called madcap puppets. But the puppets were like six feet tall. I'm talking huge. I'm not talking like hand puppets. I'm talking about huge puppets i mean five six feet tall the shows were incredible i think at the time they might have they traveled around the country I, you know it might have been five hundred dollars or something we paid but what we did is we had family book bingo so they had a whole month to complete the book bingo and everyone who complete every family that completed it got tickets then to be able to come to this special performance that's just one example um Okay, I'm looking to see. Jessica says our summer reading program kickoff is in conjunction with the YA summer. That's a good idea. So you're tying your kickoff in with the YMCA summer kickoff. Great idea. Okay, so family book big note. Uh, okay, next kindergarten readiness programs. Um, I, how many of you? Again, you could type this in your box <laughs> in the chat box. How many of you actually go to school? 
the schools when they're doing the registration process and have a table or information about the library. Uh, I know different libraries do that. Some of you might participate in the Thousand Books Before Kindergarten program. Some of you might do, uh, there's some libraries, again, this is from that idea book I keep referring to. There were some libraries that actually do story time programs just for those kids that are about to enter kindergarten, you know? Uh, and they focus on skills that kids need to transition to kindergarten. Okay, let's see what people have to say here. Um, all three, good. Kindergarten registration and, can't read that, 1K books, it looks like. I don't know why I'm not sure reading that for some reason. Okay. Um, and so what people are typing. So we'll, we'll I'll, let, I'll let you keep on typing because we're, that's our next topic. We're moving in to the second part of our little topic today, and that is kindergarten readiness. And I can see by the clock I'm going to have to move a little bit faster. Okay. Here's, um, I found this on the web, and I just thought it was so neat. It's also one of your little handouts that you can download. Uh, so you don't have to search for it in the web. <laughs> But it's it's just they're all little skills that kids are supposed to have before they go to kindergarten. And so, you know, you could give this out to families, uh, you know, maybe they could, you know, click off and, and, and make sure their kids know these little skills before they get to, to kindergarten. I just thought it was a neat way to present it. Okay. Uh, we do 1,000 books before kindergarten, Janine is saying. Um Handouts bottom right. Select a handout. Oh, yeah, okay. She's talking about where to get handouts. Okay, so let's move on to kindergarten readiness. I have done so much research on this lately to try to prepare for this webinar that I was just so overwhelmed I didn't know what to do. So what I did was I tried to narrow down. Um, everybody has their own list of what skills kids are for kindergarten. So I kept reading and comparing and reading and comparing. And this is, these are kind of, they kind of all fall into this in one way or the other. Um, language skill, fine motor skills, reading writing skills, math skills, social emotional, gross motor skills, and self-help skills. Now, some of the other people have, oh, they have to pay attention or follow directions. That kind of goes under language skills. They have to be able to cut. Okay, that goes under fine motor. They have to know letter recognition, beginning sounds. That fits under reading readiness. They need to know shapes and colors and numbers. That fits under math skills. So I tried to, I tried to group it all together. Now, we, there's what, one, two, three, four, five, seven things there. We are going to look at the first four, language skills, fine motor skills, reading readiness, and math skills, and we're going to talk about what we can do in our story times, and with ECRR story times particularly, how can we help with these kindergarten skills? And I'm going to go through this a little faster than I wanted to because I'm looking at the clock here. I'm going to run out of time. So... Give children a chance to answer questions. That's narrative skills. You know, hold up, hold up the book and say, look, what do you think this book is about? You know, give them a chance to answer questions. Two-step directions. I am the first person that, and I'm almost embarrassed to say this now because when I was teaching, well, I was still teaching at Kent, but I was teaching grad students, I said, don't use, you know, like crafts and story times. You should, and don't use, don't use that. You should be using open-ended art. And I still believe in using open-ended art. It's great for creativity. But, you know, there's something to be said for crafts, too. I have to admit, that was a mistake. Because for kids, particularly at this age, if you're doing a craft where everybody looks the same, like the teacher model, you know, there's still something in following directions. And kids have to be able to understand directions. Okay, the third one here, making predictions about a story being read, read like jump, fall, jump. Um, what do you think is going to, how, how did, how's the frog going to get away? Do you have any idea? I mean, asking questions like this, having the kids to help make predictions, um, very important. Okay, let's think about fine motor skills. What can we do in story time to help with fine motor skills? Give kids opportunities to use colored pencils and crayons. We can um, give them opportunity to use scissors. We can give them opportunity to trace shapes. Maybe you do a whole story time in shapes and they have shapes they can trace later. Great. Great for fine motor, uh, making some alphabet letters, um, having simple puzzles. Uh, when I did story times, we often had like a little play time afterwards, and I put out puzzles that were appropriate for those ages. These are all things that can help with fine motor skills. Math skills, we can use books, counting books in our story time, and, and help kids learn those numbers from 1 to 10. Help them be able to give basic shapes or name colors using color books. 
identifying things from the smallest to largest. I'm just going to throw out one book right now. It's an oldie but goodie. It was called Blue Sea. It was written by Robert Kalan, K-A-L-A-N. It's a wonderful book. It's a wonderful book. It's one little fish in the big blue sea. Along comes a big fish. Swim, little fish. Along come a bigger fish. Swim, big fish. Swim, little fish. And here comes the biggest fish of all. Swim, bigger fish. Swim, big fish. Swim, little fish. The whole book goes about like that. It talks about small to large. It's just the perfect book to help them understand that concept. Great book. Go, go look at it if you don't know it. It's an oldie. Okay, how can we help with reading, reading readiness skills and story time? Okay, kids who enjoy listening to stories, that they have great reading reading skills, but we have to remember that we need to use books that we are enthusiastic about. We have to remember to use books that they can participate in. We have to remember that some kids are visual learners, so we need to do some, have some prompts or use a mag board or a flannel board. You know, we need to get kids turned on and excited about books. Uh, print awareness and book directionality. Uh, print awareness. Have books where, um, like uh, Mo Willems, um, that's not a good idea, or drat that fat cat where the print is greatly enlarged. Every double page, double page spread says, no, he was not. That's going to help with print awareness. Uh, reciting the alphabet and identifying most letters. Um, you know, again, you can use alphabet books, have them sing the alphabet. And remember, sometimes singing the alphabet, that LMNOP is hard. I know I mentioned this in workshops when I was out in Michigan. Sing it to Mary Had a Little Lamb. Mary Had a Little Lamb. Um, a, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. It, it, you don't have that L, M, N, O, P problem. <laughs> okay, have children write their own names on their name tag, if you have name tags. If you don't have name tags, think about name tags and have them write their own name if they can on, the, on their name tag. That's going to help them. Other reading, writing the skills, recognizing rhyming words. Um, I think of the book as your mama a llama when I think about that for some reason. Um, I have them, I, I read it, I, is your mama a llama? I ask my friend Dave. No, she's not, is the answer Dave gave. She hangs by her feet and she lives in a cave. I don't believe that's how llamas behave. Oh, I said, you're right about that. I think your mama sounds more like a, and I don't give them the answer. And I don't turn the page. I let them guess what the rhyming word is. Um, can repeat familiar songs, poems, finger plays, right? Nourish it. Well, of course they're doing that when we're using those things in our story time. Uh, help retell a simple story. You know, after you read a book, can they help retell Goldilocks and the Three Bears, for example? Okay, uh, the last part of what I'm going to talk about today in the remaining minutes I have uh, is something that's more Michigan uh, related, and that is um, there's a document, it's called. Um, Kindergarten readiness. Uh, it's a kindergarten readiness document, and it's it's was done by the Early Literacy Task Force, which is a work group of the General Education Leadership Network, which is part of the Michigan Association of Intermediate School Administrators. And this document, which um, is called, and that's the website, but you don't have to write it down because it's in your handout. It's called Essential Instructional Practices in Early Literacy. So this is a document that your schools are feeling are essential practices kids should have in early literacy. Okay? Again, I can't highlight everything. I'm just going to highlight a few of them. Uh, and I'm quoting from them. In other words, when you see dramatic play, these are things, those four things there are things that they are saying in that document that kids should have, a, you know, availability of. So we're looking at, uh, and before I, move, oh geez, before I move on to that, let's see. Um, Diana says kids write their name on the craft they make. Okay, that's good. Denise said, I'm sorry, Denise says kids are writing their name on the craft. Good, very good. Okay, so again, this is from this essential um, uh, instructional practices in early literacy. Uh, building related books and block play. Well, I hope you all have blocks <laughs> because, you know, that's important. Envelope, stationery, postcard, stamps, and actual mail for a post office. Writing materials and writing centers. And then 
This is exactly an example, exactly out of their, their document. Share a book such as The Little Red Hen using puppets and objects from the story. Okay, let's look at these four things. Uh, block play, I'm sure a lot of you have that. Try to have blocks for kids of different ages if you can, like Duplos and Legos or maybe Lincoln Logs. Um, this is in a library. It might even be a Michigan library. I unfortunately cannot remember where I took this picture. But they change it every month. They have a little writing center and they can mail letters. Like here they mail letters to uh, Pete the Cat. Uh, this is this is a writing center at a desk. You put out things like that, kids are going to love to sit down at tables and do this in your library. And this is me, and I think it was Michigan. <laughs> and maybe you recognize those people. Remember they, in that document they said about a little red hen? These are my little red hen puppets. You don't have to have puppets, so you can act it out without puppets. But these are my little red hen, the paper bag puppets. But it's definitely... A, I, I just thought it was so neat that they gave that as an example in their dramatic play, because that's one I like to do an awful lot. Okay, let's move on in their document. They have a thing called vo about vocabulary. Give child-friendly explanations of words within the text. Like when you're talking about cats for sale, once there was a peddler who sold cats, just give a child-friendly explanation. It doesn't have to be long. A peddler is a person who sells things. Revisiting words after reading by using tools such as movement, props, and creative dramatic, and using dramatic play to encourage conversation. Again, acting out the little red hen, acting out um, the, the three pigs, acting out Goldilocks, all important. Phonological awareness, listening to and creating variations on books with rhyming or alliteration, and singing songs. Again, from this Michigan document. Rhyming dust bunnies, how could you get a better book for rhyming words? He asked right in the book, what rhymes with car? Tar, jar, far. Perfect book for that. Uh, Nanette's Baguette. What a wonderful book for sound awareness. Uh, if you're looking for a great book for sound awareness, look at that one. Uh, and then song books. We could go from here to eternity mentioning song picture books. Uh, this is Eric Litwin's newest one. Uh, he's the guy who wrote Pete the Cat, Groovy Joe, Ice Cream, and Dinosaurs. Okay, again, from the essential um, literacy document from Michigan, they're saying we need high, you need to have a high-quality alphabet chart, mention letter sounds with words like D is for dinosaur, and share alphabet books. Okay, Kathy, and Kathy can let, type in. I don't know if she still has any. She used to have a, an alphabet poster for libraries, but she might be out of them now. I don't know. We'll let her type in and, and answer that. But if you can get some kind of chart or something with alphabet letters or just get a magnetic board and magnetic letters and have it there. You're sharing alphabet books, point to those letters each time. Um, and then share some good, uh, share your own favorite ones. These are a couple, couple that I like, LMNOPs and also Alligator Alphabet by Stella Blackstone. Great colors in that one. Okay, also from the Michigan document, reading material, sharing a wide range of books, including storybooks, poetry, nonfiction books, having access to recorded books, comfortable places to look at books, and having children make handmade books. Okay, wide range of books. Try to include a nonfiction book every now and then in your story time or a poetry book. Comfortable places to look at books. I love this one. <laughs> nice beanbag chairs. And making handmade books. That upper left-hand uh, picture is a library that it's called Kids Own Book Cubby where they make their own books and they get to display them. All right, we're on our last slides here, the last minute. Um, okay, so the last thing, and again, this is from the Michigan document. It says, collaborate with parents in promoting literacy. We need families to engage in language and literacy interactions with their children. What better way than every child ready to read? Which is exactly what Michigan has been immersing you in the last year and this year. So right there, what they're asking you to do in Michigan, you know, if you get involved in ECRR, you are doing that. Okay, let's see if there's any last comments here before we close out for the day or any questions. Please type them in. Uh, okay, she's saying that Mel, which you all know about, has an ABC, ABC poster for book flicks. Uh, Denise says we have two early literacy story walks in our community. That's really great. Uh, two early literacy story walks um, and Kathy's giving you the link to order the order form link for supplies a couple of the people are, are typing and we'll just look at this in a second 
I, I just want to close out today by telling you this, this, ooh, this, sorry, this next webinar may not be for you. <laughs> it is story time basics. And probably a lot of you listening today will think, well, that's not for me. And I recognize it might not be for you, but you might know of other people in your library that it would be for. Maybe there's someone in your library who's never done a baby story time. Um, think about um, whether there, if it's not you, if there might be somebody else that needs what I call story time 101. So we're going to talk about babies. We're going to talk about uh, a, a toddler or a two and three old story time. We're going to talk about um, in the older preschools. I am not going to talk about mixed age story times because I did a whole webinar on mixed age story times. And Kathy said all those webinars are archived now. You can find them on the site. So we did a whole one on a like a family story time or a mixed age story time. So we're not going to talk about that in this particular webinar, but we are going to talk about again story time 101 basics for the for the uh, zero up to age five. Um, links to the newsletters and upcoming webinar information. She's giving that link. Uh, I am finished. I think I might have gone a minute over. I apologize. Thank you, Jessica, for coming. Thank you all for attending and. Um, I, you're doing some great stuff. Seriously, I'm, I'm very impressed. Uh, thank you for attending. And if you know of anyone that would be interested in Storytime Basics, please promote it. I know that's in the middle of summer reading. So thank you very much. Yes. Anyway, and thank ahead, you, Kathy. everyone, for coming. Uh, we've got Sue coming back, as the slide says, on July 11th. And then we also have her again with us on September 7th and November 28th. Those are our last few uh, Every Child Ready to Read training webinars. Uh, this is all brought to you by the Institute for Museum and Library Services, and uh, we've really had a great uh, couple of years here with Sue. And don't forget, you can download those handouts on the bottom right, and I shared the link to get the newsletter if you're not already on our newsletter mailing list you are welcome uh, to join us on there we've got a newsletter every month coming to you from sue so and yes shannon um, this is going to be archived we have a link on the site i shared above to our webinar archives so thank you all for coming today thank you thank sue you, kathy. thank you kathy yep. thank you have a good day you too